right, the first four minutes of exposure is about to come through. I wanted you guys to see it. You can see my focus star there. Here we go, Pac-Man Nebula. Boom. Look at that. Hi everyone, this is Trevor Jones and this is the Astro Backyard. Tonight I'm going to photograph an incredible nebula in the constellation Cassiopeia using an affordable camera and telescope combo. I wanted to share even more results using my budget rig setup so you can get ideas for building your own system. I'm not saying this stuff is cheap, more like astrophotography on a budget. Let's get into it. With a clear night in the forecast and a moon that doesn't come up until about 1 a.m., I should be able to capture an amazing deep sky image for my backyard tonight. Tonight's target is the dynamic Pac-Man Nebula in Cassiopeia. It's big, it's bright, and September is probably the best month to go after it. To find the Pac-Man, just look below the bright star Shidar in the W constellation rising in the northeastern sky. That's Cassiopeia. I chose this target because it's the perfect size for my camera and telescope combo. It's also bright enough to cut through the city light pollution I deal with here in the backyard. I'll use a light pollution filter to help me capture a punchy image. This one's called the Optolong L Enhance. This is a dual band filter that allows the light from the H alpha and O3 band passes to shine through. It's perfect for emission nebulae like the Pac-Man and it's almost as good as the more expensive L Extreme. At the heart of this rig is the SV Boney S V550, a telescope you can buy on Amazon that doesn't suck. It's an 80 millimeter triplet APO that uses three lens elements, including FPL 51 glass. While SV Boney is considered a budget brand, or at least it was, this is a quality telescope capable of amazing astrophotography. The stars look pretty darn good captured through this triplet, at least from the type of imaging I've been doing with it. I'll try to take a few broadband test images if I get another clear night before this video goes live. If I do, that will go Go right. Here's the broadband image test on the SV550. This is of the Iris Nebula using three minute exposures and a light pollution filter, the Optolong L Pro. So a true broadband test of the optics of this telescope. And what we're looking for is the star quality and shape. So if you see the star shape there, there's a little bit of jaggedness to the stars. They're not perfectly round. I've certainly seen a lot worse than this, but it just gives you an idea of what to expect for, for star shape. And then nothing weird stands out in terms of color correction. Sometimes you see with the blue stars, there's a bit of a halo or something going on there, but everything looks great in that regard for color correction. And a nice little image of the uh, the Iris Nebula. This is just a the auto stretch. I haven't processed it or anything yet. Really, uh, you know, it's within acceptable range for, for me anyway, especially after processing. So I think it's doing a, a great job and, as I said, a broadband image test is the true test of a telescope's optics. Here's an image I took with this system back in March. Although I had already heard good things about the SV550, I was pretty shocked at how good this turned out. At a focal length of 480 millimeters at f6, it's a practical focal length for a wide variety of deep sky targets. It actually reminds me a lot of my first real astrophotography telescope, the Explore Scientific ED80. Man, that takes me back. I've attached one of the most affordable dedicated astronomy cameras you can buy to the scope, the ASI 585 MC Pro. It's a color camera with internal cooling and an astro modified sensor that picks up that important H alpha wavelength of light. This camera has all of the power and features of some of the more expensive cameras I use just in a smaller package. I'm currently testing the air version of this camera as well and I think that'll be a huge hit with the amateur astrophotography community. The telescope mount is the most important piece of this entire rig. Without smooth tracking, the best cameras and telescopes on the market are useless. The Skywatcher EQ AL55i is a modest mount with a 22 pound max payload in a traditional EQ design. It's a step up from a star tracker and in my tests, it's done an admirable job. There are some quirks to this mount and I'll get to that in a minute. 
To keep things mostly automated, I'm using an ASI Air to control everything wirelessly from inside the house. It can do everything from finding targets in the night sky for me to auto guiding and dithering during my session. But before I can do that, I need to make sure everything is balanced using the counterweight and also polar aligned with the North Celestial Pole. I can't stress enough how important these two steps are, so take the time to get it right. You may have noticed this little gray box up here. This is the SV241 power box. It gives me some additional ports and cleans up the cabling. I use it to power my ASI Air Mini and to run the dew heater bands for moisture control. All of the images I capture are stored on a mini USB thumb drive plugged into the ASI Air that I download onto my computer the next morning. This telescope comes in a package that includes the dedicated field flattener. This is an additional item, so make sure you factor that into your budget. I highly recommend getting one if you want to maximize the performance of the SV550, especially if you want to use it with your DSLR camera or another crop sensor astronomy camera. The ASI 585MC Pro camera I'm using has a really small sensor so it's really forgiving in terms of the edges of the frame. Without the flattener expect to see some misshapen stars around the edges of the frame if you're using a larger sensor camera. This camera and telescope pairing creates a tighter field of view than you might expect from a relatively wide field refractor telescope like this. At a focal length of 480 millimeters using this camera sensor I get an image scale of 1.2 arc seconds per pixel. This is a good match and the images won't look too soft or too crunchy. The stars look nice and soft and round, but my deep sky object looks crisp and detailed. A number of people have asked me about this telescope mount because they've heard problems with declination backlash and I've even heard people saying that you have to take it apart and make adjustments. While I don't recommend cracking this thing open, I have seen some odd behavior in my guiding graph. It's always in the declination axis and it eventually works itself out. In my tests, I lose about two subs for every 40, 50 images in my plan. It's not ideal, but I think proper balance, guiding, and a max payload well under 22 pounds will help. I think dithering after every frame might make it worse because that's where I see the hiccup in the declination axis right after dithering. I've changed my plan to dither after every two frames to see if that helps. Otherwise, it feels like a mini EQ6R and works perfectly with the ASI Air or with a SynScan hand controller. Make sure you pick up this connection cable if you plan on using the ASI Air to control the mount. Here's an example of the tracking accuracy of that Skywatcher EQAL55i mount. So I have about 120 or exactly 120 frames here on the Iris Nebula. And you could probably see it when I blink them there, about six or seven of them are unusable that I'll need to dump in my stack. Now these are three minute exposure, so nothing crazy, but um, you know, I find that to be an acceptable amount of subs that we're throwing away uh, due to that declination backlash error in the mount. So nothing too crazy, nothing to worry about. I could still recommend the mount, but uh, I definitely wanted to make that clear to you. So this is with auto guiding, uh, with a modest rig, small refractor on that AL eq 55 i My plan tonight is to capture as many four minute sub exposures on NGC 281 as I can. It's a bright target with lots of signal, but to pull up the dimmer areas and to keep everything smooth, the more overall integration time, the better. To achieve exposures of this length, I'll use a mini auto guiding system to improve tracking accuracy. This is a Starfield 30 millimeter guide scope and I have an ASI 120mm mini in there. To achieve focus on the guide stars through this little scope, I just move the camera ever so slightly in the tube until those tiny stars get nice and sharp. The ASI Air auto guiding feature uses multi-star guiding and it works so well that I really don't even have to think about it. The only thing really missing from this setup is an auto focuser. That would measure the star size in the images and make any tiny adjustments needed to keep them sharp throughout the imaging session. I've been using the Batnoff mask from another telescope to focus the SV550 on a bright star. I have to come outside and refocus if there are any major temperature changes, but I I really don't mind babysitting the rig, especially if it means coming out on a beautiful, perfect night like this. Okay, it's almost time to get this sucker polar aligned and pointed at my target.
first four minutes of exposure is about to come through. I wanted you guys to see it. You can see my focus star there. Here we go, Pac-Man Nebula. Boom. Look at that. See, I told you it was punchy. Beautiful. When you see the final image, I think you'll agree that this is a winning combo in terms of a complete deep sky astrophotography kit. Of course, you could swap anything for whatever you already have or upgrade something, but this is a good template for someone on a tight budget. The grand total for everything you see here is just under $3,000. I've included a complete guide for building a kit like this in the description and one for choosing a smart telescope if you wanna skip all this. I hope you enjoy my final image using this kit and until next time, clear skies.